Hi, I'm Bob Batcher. I'm a board member with the Tidewater Winds right here in Norfolk and Hampton Roads, Virginia. And I'm with three very special people who served our nation. And um, as musicians, as uh, service people, but also as members of the Tidewater Winds Band. So welcome, guys. Thanks, Hello. Bob. How are you all doing? I'm going to start off with uh, the couple up to the, my left. I'm not sure where you are in our position. That's the beauty of doing Zoom. Uh, but you guys uh, started off as military musicians, right? So if you want to introduce yourselves in perspective of the military musician. Becky? Oh, well, let me see. I started out at the School of Music. Uh, I won the audition as a civilian. I had no idea what, was, what I was in for, but I did that. Uh, they liked my playing. I was hired, and then I went to boot camp. Oh, so you started off as a civilian and then yeah. went active duty. Well, I, w I didn't go into the military immediately. Uh, I was looking at it thinking, well, maybe this is better than teaching school. <laughs> we're we're going to talk a little bit about there. And I want to, the, before the end of the interview, was it better? Don't tell me now. Was it better than teaching? Now, the guy sitting next to you, you know him? Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, what's your background on, on getting into the military band? Um, I think I, I was drafted in 1967. I was a music major in college and I got drafted. And uh, I found that if you auditioned for the band, you could get your choice of band. So I went and auditioned, got a high enough score and was sent directly to the band in Los Angeles, uh, the army band, uh, which was a, a dream assignment. and. Uh, when I realized I was going to have to go to Korea, I auditioned for the School of Music, um, sort of the same way Becky did, and uh, waited a little while for someone to leave and got assigned to the School of Music and was there for 15 years, aside from one year in Korea. And the Tidewater Winds, how that graduated, the band came about, and it was originally a union sponsored. Oh. And when the union started to loosen its regulations. Um, we got in the Tidewater Winds, several of us from the School of Music. Um, I don't know if we auditioned or not, but uh, it used to be uh, we signed union papers on every concert and were pretty much paid by the union and donations. So we found our way in uh, a logical step um, straight ahead, and there was no marching in the Tidewater Winds, which was really nice. Yeah, I'm going to talk about that. Yeah, going from the field and marching to sitting in a chair. Oh, in the military at the School of Music, we sat in a chair a lot, but even when I was stationed in the field, um, we really, uh, we did everything. I mean, uh, there couldn't be a better prepared uh, musician for the Tidewater Winds than an ex-military musician because they've done that job for many years and they just seamlessly fit right into the, the music the style and the discipline that's required for the winds. Okay, can I, I see your, your wheels are moving. You're going back down through memory lane, right? <laughs> that's when, did you, when did you go in the Navy? Well, I came in the Navy in 1989 after playing as a euphonium player in the Fest House band in uh, Williamsburg at the uh, Bush Gardens, did that for a couple years after college, uh, came in, auditioned down at the School of Music, just like Bob and uh, uh, did, and um, I won the audition and the Navy accepted me, and um, I spent the next 30 years uh, being a Navy musician. Oh, well, now which comes first? Do you have to be accepted in, if you're going for, is it special services to be in the, to be in the band? Well, I mean, you need to audition to be uh, a musician in any of the services. They don't just take anybody. So you have to show some skill on the instrument, um, or whatever your chosen instrument is. Now, have you guys already signed the paperwork for the military before you auditioned? So yeah. if you don't pass yeah, I, your audition, you're swabbing the deck? That's right. That's, and that has happened to some people over the years who weren't smart enough to, uh, <laughs> to not sign until after the audition. <laughs> Tom, how did you do? Did you sign first and then? Um, I remember um, in the summer of 1967, that goes way back, um, 
I got. I it. remember it though. <laughs> I realized I was going to be drafted, and if you went down and signed up, and volunteered, you could get your choice of assignments into the field. And I had a, I immediately went down and auditioned at the local army band. They gave me a letter. I went and enlisted in the army. Did all of the thing, things you had to do to get in the physical and whatever. And then uh, went to boot camp and was assigned to the band in Los Angeles, pre-assigned. Now, most people then, 98% of the people auditioning, uh, would go through boot camp and then come here to the School of Music in Norfolk uh, to study for most of them for six months prior to being assigned to often any band in the world were, uh, that needed musicians at that time. So there were different tracks people could take. They could advance out of the school. Um, getting on the staff at the school originally was a special band assignment. Um, I was there for 15 years. Becky, you were there for 10? 10. 10 years. And it was originally designed to last forever until some general came down and said, what? You stay here forever? Uh, <laughs> that. And we all started to have, uh, Becky went to Korea. I went to Korea. Now, what was nice is after Korea, I came right back to the school and uh, was then able to play in the Tidewater Winds. Uh, um, Ken, uh, you got out in 80, in 2019. I got, I came in in 67, got out in 88. Wow. Yeah. See, I, I remember 67 because right after that, um, I had a little uh, love note from the, from the federal government providing me an opportunity to travel the world. And I decided to put the paperwork for Air Force because I had no rhythm. I couldn't join the band, but they had core fam shoes. So yeah. <laughs> uh, I didn't, I didn't go in. Um, why the military for you guys? Why, you know, I mean, you can make millions of dollars being a uh, recording star musician. <laughs> That's so why do you want to work for the military? Well, I, I'll be the first to answer on this one. I think that, you know, military service as a bandsman is, it's very secure form of, of a job. Um, freelance musicians really struggle with, with paying the bills. You got to have enough gigs every month to pay your bills as a freelance musician uh, or take up on some other kind of work uh, like teaching or, you know, in some other field. And so for me, it was about job security. The, the number of people that go on to, to make, you know, these superstar recording contracts, that's a very, very tiny percentage of the overall, um, of the overall business. And so most of the people out there are working uh, from one job to the next in what is commonly now referred to as the gig economy. Yes. Tom? Uh yeah, Tom, why, why the, in, in, especially in 67, because there was a thing going on called Vietnam. Yeah, well, I got drafted, but for me, uh, when I enlisted at the time, I heard uh, a very successful studio musician say it this way, 90% of the work is done by 10% of the players, yeah. which means 90% of the players are, have 10% of the work. It's very insecure, and it's much less insecure now. Um, if you're not playing in a major symphony or in the military, right. um, it's, it's not a viable. And where else? I retired at 42 years old um, with a full pension for the rest of my life, payable at 42 years old. Yeah. You can't do that. I meet old friends I knew in the band and from teaching it from this school and from Korea and so on, and they all, ever to a T, say, oh, I wish I would have stayed in. Mm -hmm. I can do anything at 42 that I could have done at 22. That's right. I could have done it much better after being in the military, such as playing in the Tidewater Winds. There we go. Up. Well, and, and um, you still have the same passion, though, for the music. It's just that you're supporting yourself with it. Oh, the passion is there. And, yeah. and the opportunities to play solos with the bands, to pursue a jazz performance, which would not pay on the outside and have that income to play musicals. Um, Becky played for many years. How many years well, with the symphony? 17 years in the symphony. Wow. But it all had to change for that to happen. So you have to understand that. Yeah. So, okay. But there's no tour bus, 
right? You fly by lap of luxury. Oh no! Uh, I wouldn't thing. say. Am I wrong there too? <laughs> I wouldn't say that. I mean, I've I've been on a number of flights on C-17s and helicopters and flown all over, you know, all over the place. I mean, they, you're not necessarily in the lap of luxury, uh, but you are, for the most part, getting three square meals a day. And, and you know that your rent's going to be paid that month because you're getting the same pay based on your rank every month. Um, it's, it's like Tom said, it, it provides great job security. Uh, and the competition out there in the civilian sector is very, very high for a very small number of jobs that just don't pay as well. And it's really, as also as Tom said, it's the only place outside of a major symphony orchestra that you can get a 20-year pension. Now, that's not guaranteed because you have to get advanced to the rank that permits that pension, um, but it's, it's available. And that's one of the reasons why I, I, I came in to begin with and stuck with it, uh, because basically I always felt like I was getting paid to practice and to learn as many styles of music as possible. Okay, now something tells me, though, under that top paperwork, when you signed on to a musician, they didn't tell you about other duties deemed necessary. <laughs> so are you actually playing music eight hours a day in, re in rehearsal? Or as a, as a military musician, are there other, ju other duties? Oh, big time other duties. <laughs> I think in the Army and the Marines, uh, there are times in the um, I think it was brought up before where a uh, band served overseas and never played. They were doing their secondary mission, such as prisoner handling, guard duty, perimeter, transportation, whatever was needed at the time. Um, they may have just put the band together for some ceremonies occasionally, but there's always a secondary mission. The other thing someone, a young person coming up or that may help with the winds is the military, you have to be on time you have to look good, you have to play the right notes, and you have to take whatever comes and roll with it. And then sometimes people can't handle that from a personality view, viewpoint, a discipline viewpoint. And I think that comes into play with some young people who serve on tour and get out because they just can't take the lifestyle. Um, others, uh, Marines, it can really be compressed um, that lifestyle of being a Marine first um, and then being a musician second. Becky, I want to ask you this because you're the, you're the teacher among the three. Um, there's a lot of discipline in music. I mean, I think people, when they sit down and they, it, that word of entertainment is thrown around a lot, but I mean, it is really a structured discipline profession, right? Yes. So that should dovetail kind of what Tom was saying dovetail into the whole precision and discipline of the military. Yeah. What do you say? I agree. So you spent your time so, at the school. Time, and maybe you can comment on this, Becky, when there were very few, uh, the field had just opened up for women when she came in. I think when you got to the school, there may have been three women out of 110 faculty members. Uh, Becky, have you got a lot of time? I was the only female instructor on the first deck. Yeah, she has a lot of stories. <laughs> yeah, but can you? Well, this is the internet. You can tell them. Oh, <laughs> oh you don't. You don't want to hear the stories about teaching a Marine um, gunnery sergeant and having an E5 uh, horn instructor wanting to uh, get him to set his life straight. <laughs> that was always fun. It was. Yeah. Those lessons were great. Now, when you're teaching, okay, and, well, let's go back. You got, all of you have mentioned the School of Music up at Little Creek, yes. which I didn't become aware of until about it. My dad was a retired, have I mentioned my dad was a retired Marine Corps Master Sergeant who was at Iwo Jima, didn't have, couldn't sing a note, couldn't play a note, but he fought at Iwo Jima. And he was actually invited to come up to the, to the school to talk about his Marine Corps experience. And it probably was the most meaningful day in, in his late life uh, to be able to share to these young men and women um, about what, uh, what it was like in World War II. Um, so there is this love of country and military from a band member, right? I mean, it's, it's all wrapped up in the same thing of duty and honor, right? Absolutely, yeah, I mean, you're you're there um, to provide 
uh, you know, some excitement for the for the people you're playing for, some patriotic spirit because of the type of music you're playing. Uh, you know, American music, a lot of it, from John Philip Sousa all the way to American composers, uh, like, you know, that people are familiar with. So that's part of your purpose as a military musician is to inspire patriotism. Right. So as you know, part of the, part of the, of the Angeles and I played at over, somewhere over 300 funerals during the Vietnam War, both wow. for duty and retired servicemen. And that really brings it home. When they fold the flag, they fire the weapons, and you play taps. Um, playing on the 4th of July always brings it home. And it takes it to every other aspect of uh, recruiting, watching the troops cheer where they have no entertainment. It's, uh, it's, that, that's always there, and it's part of what all musicians do. Tom, I got to ask you, taps with keys or no keys? Bugle or trumpet? Trumpet. Oh, trumpet. Yeah. I spent 15 years at the school teaching, and the whole time I was playing musicals, uh, playing in other bands, rock bands, funk bands, playing the circus. Um, Becky played everything in the world, jazz, trios, combos, um, playing shows, playing keyboard, playing horn. I mean, the, everything is there. Uh, but for Becky, I think it's French horn. Oh, oh yes. For me, it's strong. And from the time I was 18, uh, my goal in life was to play and to teach. And playing at the, being at the School of Music is like saying you just walked in where you can play and you can teach. And that's the, I think everybody, any musician, looks at that perfect gig. Unfortunately, they all come to an end. Well, my, my clarinet days came to an end around sixth grade. So going beyond <laughs> learning how to play. So what do you teach at the School of Music? Because they're, by the time they're there, they know how to play their instrument, right? Uh, uh, most. Of <laughs> most? Um, they come in at different levels. Okay. And so you have to work with somebody who has very little experience as opposed to the college graduate who sometimes thinks he or she knows everything. Yeah, I so, think Ken could comment on what's happening recently, but back during Vietnam, you got people coming in that could only play two, two out of the 12 scales and read quarter notes and eighth notes, and uh, they had an instrument or they could make a sound and you had to turn them into something. Or an average high school player. I've heard the military bands today and they are exquisite by comparison. Now I played in an excellent army band in Los Angeles that was filled with professionals for four and a half years, but that was by far the exception. Um, I've heard the bands today and the musicians today and the trumpet players today, I mean, wow. Um, it's a really changed. Now is the Little Creek School Navy only or is it all military bands? Well, they so are the Little, Little Creek Navy spot. And so, and, Marine. and the, Marine, the Marines are caught in the middle. Um, the Navy has its school in the school, in the building, and the Army has its school in the building. Okay. Now, Ken, did you go to that same school? <laughs> hmm? uh, yes, I did. Um, actually, uh, I went there for the uh, basic course, like everybody does. Uh, and then also went there for our advanced course. And then I was also an instructor there for three, three and a half years. Um, but to back, back, uh, backtrack on what Tom was saying, the overall skill set of the musicians that are being hired by all of our service services today is extremely high. For instance, as far as the Navy goes, when I came in in 1989, a good majority of the people were coming out of high school. Some had college degrees. And a few had, very few had a master's degree. Today, most of the people that the Navy hires, uh, and I know this because I served at the, um, at the Navy unit in charge of the entire band program in Millington, Tennessee, at Naval Personnel Command, when we hired all the Navy musicians. Uh, most of the Navy musicians coming in today, in fact, all of them have uh, bachelor's degrees. Many of them have master's degrees. And in the three years that uh, I was the master chief, in charge of personnel for Navy bands, we hired, I think, three high school graduates in three and a half years. 
uh, the rest were either bachelor's or master's degree holders. Wow. Um, so the, the overall skill set of, and this is all the services because I saw it on staff at School of Music, uh, the overall skill set is incredibly high. Um, we're now, uh, the field bands, as the Army calls them, the fleet bands, as the Navy calls them, the Marines, um, the skill set in all the bands now is almost on par with the DC bands. Um, it's very close. It's, uh, makes you very proud when you hear a military band today because this, the skill level is incredibly high. Okay, when I watch the news at night and I hear stories about the military in Afghanistan or whatever, it's usually about the, the fighting. The first record of military bands or music in the military, this is from our crack research, came in at 1754. Now, none of you guys were there, but I'm sure as part, and if you were, we'll have to talk about that, but I'm sure part of the school you talk, what was the purpose of the early days? I mean, you mentioned Williamsburg, Kent. I mean, I think everybody who's been to Williamsburg talks about the fife and drum. And, and, and when you're there, you hear it all over the place. And I hear a lot of rhythm in that. I mean, is that one of the reasons for, for having music in the, in the military? Yeah, the, the original purpose of musicians in the military uh, was for signals, uh, signal calling out on the battlefield. So um, over in Europe, you had uh, European armies, and they might have, uh, back in the day, would be a bugler uh, or drums. And certain patterns, rhythmic patterns, or certain blasts from the bugle would mean certain things to the soldiers on the field. Because you got to remember that, you know, they didn't have the technology that we have. And the actual din of fighting on the battlefield was very loud. And so mm -hmm. you had to have something to control those massive numbers of troops that uh, they could hear. Uh, and so from my studies, that's, that's where military musicians kind of got their start. That was their purpose. So when my mother complained about my trumpet being too loud as a kid before I became a clarinet player, it was a serving a good purpose. Absolutely. Right, right, Tom? Now, when you were in Korea, what was your role as a musician there, Tom? Um, I went over as the sergeant major of the 8th Army Band in Seoul, Korea. Um, the one thing I did that I really enjoyed, besides being the, the uh, assistant band leader and getting to conduct and do ceremonies and so on, was I did what a lot of them don't do, is I wanted to play. I've always been a player. And as uh, the senior person in the band, the enlisted person, I could make sure I got to play. That was a, the other thing was a constant fear that one, the North could do something stupid. Um, people in the South, in South Korea were very liberal, huge demonstrations in the summers when college let out. Uh, demonstrations marching right through the military bases, um, having um, 50 caliber machine gun, a truck, and a, uh, and a couple of vans parked behind the band building ready to evacuate. I mean, there was always that something could go wrong when you're in a country like that, and you have to be ready and trained. So uh, Korea was an interesting. You got to do all the music, a lot of ceremonies, mm. but uh, you got to play the good stuff. And because I was a senior um, person, I got to play whatever I wanted to play, which was nice, but it was always scary. Okay, Tom, I have a very insightful probing question to ask you. Uh, did you have to shave the mustache off when you got in the army or did it come when you joined Tidewater Winds? Um, when I was stationed in Los Angeles um, for four and a half years with the army band, things were pretty liberal. The military would not let a mustache go beyond the corners of the mouth but I had a very handsome handlebar mustache the whole time I was in Los Angeles. It was just my personality. Now, when I came to the School of Music, they were a little more disciplined. And uh, the, uh, finally, after being there for maybe six or eight months, the commanding officer of the school called me in and said, cut the blank, blank, blank. <laughs> and I had to cut it back a great deal so it wouldn't go below the lip or beyond the corners. However, about six months before I retired, I began to secretly grow it back. Okay. So by the time I retired, the handlebar mustache had, and, and I have my uh, military official photos 
with a handlebar mustache, which is highly <laughs> unusual. Well, because I, well, what I'm thinking is I'm not sure who recruited the musicians to be in this conversation, but I noticed that the winds have been kind of, you know, ignored. So, but if you were a wind player, you could really hide some reeds up there. You could keep those reeds nice and moist. Huh? I, I'm sorry, I didn't know you were talking to me. No, Tom, Tom with the mustache. Okay, let's make the transition from the military to, uh, you mentioned it, John, let's talk John Philip Sousa because in the mustache is in the tradition of. When I say John Philip Sousa, Becky, to you, what do you think of? Um, just a band that plays his music, mostly. Oh. But why is his music so so much part of our Americana? I would say I would agree with that. That it's just a, the fiber of it, Tom. What do you think? Um, I think he was doing the same thing then we're doing now, but doing it on a different level, um, entertaining the people, uh, bridging a gap between the civilian and the military, bringing the civilians into see what's happening in the military, providing ceremonial music. Now, uh, Sousa also wrote a lot of very contemporary, I mean, he went out on the road with uh, bands that had nothing to do with the military. Really? The director of the Marine Band for years, he had his own show, and he was literally on the road like our rock bands are today, filling uh, uh, amphitheaters and doing what uh, popular entertainment does today, which is what I think uh, the Tidewater Winds does here locally, mm -hmm. bring the music of the day and the tradition um, to uh, a wide audience. And for military people, it's, I think, after retirement, I didn't want, I never wanted to play in a concert band again in my life. When I got out of the military, I'd had enough. And then Becky uh, was asked to play with the Winds, and she said, Tom, you got to come down here, you know, one rehearsal two rehearsals and play concerts. And a lot of guys from the school um, were playing in the wind. So I went down and saw my friends and said, hey, this is not your, not the same. This is on a whole different level. Mm -hmm. uh, the musicianship may be the same, but the professionalism, that one rehearsal on a bunch of concerts is really appealing. Now, Ken, the, we're, the uh, Tower Winds has gone in, in, this, in the tribute of Sousa, but is also broadening the scope of the kind of music that's being played. How does Sousa fit into show tunes? Well, Sousa is, uh, you know, as, as Tom was talking about, is uh, where our band tradition kind of got started, um, you know, and Sousa brought the music of the day, as Tom said, to all of America when he started going on tour. Um, he didn't just play marches. He, like Tom was saying, he wrote operettas, mm -hmm. uh, light music of the day. He he also you know played uh, contemporary songs that uh, Americans knew, uh, arranged for the concert band, um, and so Sousa is is about the tradition. It's kind of where our band tradition got started, uh, along with a few other band leaders of his day, Patrick Gilmore, um, and uh, Arthur Pryor. Um, so I mean where the winds are in this whole thing is, in my opinion, it's bringing back some of those traditions for your civic community uh, bands, but it's at a very high professional level. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like, like Tom was saying, uh, you've got one rehearsal for a job. And uh, I know maybe when Tom came in the military, there would be lots of rehearsals. And, and there were a lot when I came in, but today it's pretty much on par with any professional group. Uh, like the winds, you have one rehearsal and then you go out and do the job. So it's expected that your level of professional ability uh, can handle that. Well, and I think, again, kind of going behind the scenes, John Brewington, the maestro of today with Tower of Winds, will talk a little bit about the background of the piece that you guys are getting ready to play. Quite often, he's making the comment that it's a song we all recognize. It came from 007, a James Bond movie, but it's arranged by... So you may have played the same piece in L.A., but it's not the same piece when you play it on, play it on the stage at Tower of Winds, right? So those that I mean, so it's a matter of paying attention to that one rehearsal. Did you say one rehearsal you guys have? 
Right. Uh, you usually might have one or two rehearsals uh, maximum. Well, it sounds like you've been playing that music. All when do you get the music? Before you play it. Well, Alan was is the librarian. He's he has it at his house, and we get it at the beginning of the before the beginning of the season. Yeah, okay, you, so you have, you have to you sit home and play the music before you rehearse it as the whole band. Oh well, yeah, oh yeah, we we look at it very carefully. Yeah. You know, it's something that may not be brought up often is like John Philip Sousa, John Brewington, John writes a lot of the arrangements when we have soloists or right. we, we can't do it in entirety. He may do a cut and paste. He may go in and rearrange for band something that was written for a smaller group, um, a pop tune or something. So he's behind the scenes um, uh, like John Philip Sousa was writing a lot of his music, but arranging the music uh, that he needs to do the uh, programming our audience responds to. So some of that load, and especially the programming. I know there was a time that some of the players said, oh, back when Sid Berg had it, we used to play all these orchestral transcriptions and we called them barn burners and so on. And uh, uh, I think John has realized a lot as it progressed through the years, um, what our audience's tastes are. And they are indeed a John Philip Sousa, um, bring the music of the people to the people. Yeah. And you can definitely see that at the end of the concert, because I mean, there has not been a single concert that I've gone to that didn't end with a standing ovation because that fanfare will bring it out in you. So it can be, a, you can be playing a John Williams piece all throughout the concert, but you play that last Sousa piece, people are on their feet. And I love playing the concert high B flat in the Stars and Stripes finale. Yeah. Okay, Tom, you, you mentioned that word orchestra. Tell me the difference between an orchestra and a band, besides there's no strings. Besides there's no strings. I think the literature opened up uh, a lot for orchestra, but they're all combined. The clarinets take the part of the string in the, in the winds. The clarinets frequently are the violins. Um, other things, saxophones and so on, may be playing cello and violin parts in transcriptions. Um, so there, from a literature standpoint, they can go both ways. However, a band, in my mind, really has punch. Mm -hmm. uh, if, when the band cranks up and you've got eight or nine trumpets and four trombones and a couple of euphoniums and maybe 12 clarinet and people let go, it has impact. That right. will really reach out. Also, it has impact when it's outside or in a big hall. I think an orchestra often uh, a lot of their literature, as you might say, like it is more intimate, but it can be big too. But a band is a is a real, real strength. Well, and I think it's kind of cool what John's arrangements has introduced some pieces throughout the years that you traditionally, especially like a lot of the movie themes where you you hear a lot of the strings and whatever, but you guys just pull it off magically. Um, okay, you retire from the military, but you don't retire from music. So what are you guys doing now that you got out of the military? You got Tidewater Water Winds. Mm -hmm. are, you, are you back in a funk band, Tom? Um, when I got out of the military, I was 42 years old. And the first thing I did was I started playing in a Dixieland band at the ballpark. And I- Because you had to handle bar mustache. And then, <laughs> pardon? Because you had the mustache. Oh yeah. And then I started playing in a, a blues funk band for about five years. I did nine years at Bush Gardens, Bravo Ken, um, doing the shoulder seasons. I went on the road with big bands. Um, I played 14 cruise ships, about 50 musicals. Um, so my trumpet playing career really went a different direction, but really took off after the military. Now, um, could you have a glass of beer next to you? Oh, uh, well, I still have the symphony job and the opera jobs. So okay. when I'm, out, uh, I, I'm out on a medical discharge. So it's, it's not the same as making it to 20. Um, anyway, I had that. Um, I had governor school. Uh, let me see. Piano gigs. Um, I, Pian I Wait a minute. You, I thought you played French horn. 
I did. I and I then I I I played uh, piano in combos. I've been a piano player long before I was a horn player. Okay, so military service over, you guys retire, that regular paycheck turns into a retirement check, which most musicians are very jealous of. But instead of getting a nine to five bureaucratic job of shuffling paper like I do, you decide to continue playing music, right? Absolutely. It's really uh, it's decided itself. When I got out of the military, I used to be a cook. And I thought, well, oh, maybe I'll get a job as a cook. And then the playing just took off. And I, I would always look back and go, wow, all of the things I dreamed of doing in my 20s, I did in my 40s and 50s and 60s. So I played in all of the places. So I just look back and go, wow, uh, I can thank a lot of that to the military. And even the winds, the winds was an outlet when I retired. Um, that was a place to play, a high quality place to play. We're going to be joined by another musician who was in the military. Here she comes. Kathy O'Graham, how you doing? I didn't know. I didn't oh. check my email since like 10 this morning. Well, it, but you know, and that's the beauty. We're kind of talking now about the life after military when you okay. don't have to check emails all the time. Um, but the music was part of the passion. So Tom, let me finish up with, and then we're, I want to introduce Kathy to the world because she's an awesome musician also in Tywater Winds with a military background. But yeah, so the bus kind of picked you up and you went on with playing, continuing to play. Um, I think it's all a part of your experience in life, who you studied with, where you went to school, all of the things that formed, um, the look at all of the leaders, the conductors. And when I got out of the military, um, the winds were available. Uh, the winds were uh, a lot of friends, camaraderie. It was that great music that some of which I had played in the military, and it just lined up. And now it's it's just, it's a great entertainment venue. It's yep. what musicians do. It makes you a complete musician. It's what you practice for, and you practice all the time. People don't just put it in the case and take it out for the show. Um, you've got to be, to play in a band this good, you have to be ready all the time, physically and mentally. I have to tell you, Tom, you've really kind of disturbed me in the last few minutes, because this is not the first time you've mentioned practice. <laughs> Pardon me for like, chuckling. It's do you the like story practicing? Of my life. Yeah, this is what we do. Um, Doc Severinsen, the old leader of the Tonight Show band for 20 some years said, if I don't practice for one day, I know it. If I don't practice for two days, my friends notice. If I don't practice for three days, the world notices. I mean, it goes away very quickly when you're wow. in that top field. It does. So it's always practice. practicing and always learning. Always learning, growing, and having fun doing what, I mean, you have a profession, you have something you're pretty darn good at, and you probably enjoy uh, what you're doing, and that's mm -hmm. the same feeling. And what you do every day, what you do a lot of, you will be good at. And I don't play the clarinet for a reason. I didn't practice when I was learning it. Kathy, welcome. Hi. And, and I, I recognize you. Now, which, instru which instruments do you play at, at Tidewater Winds? I'm a clarinetist with Tidewater Winds. All right, a clarinetist. We finally have these, these uh, brass guys have been hogging the conversation. Right, I know. I know Bob from um, the Norfolk Health and Wellness Club, remember? Yep. We've chatted yep, there. Yep, from working. That's right. Um, Kathy, why, why are you playing with the Tidewater Winds then? Well, exactly what Tom said. It's a real continuation of what we grew up doing and not just grew up like as kids, but then our whole like young adulthood into middle adulthood, etc. We're all always doing the same thing. Uh, playing band music, like he said, practicing all the time. So I come out of that kind of environment. <clears throat> I'm from Ohio 
And I feel like the Big Ten States band programs are just next level. And I come from one of the top bands in the state. My teacher, my band director was a military uh, from the Navy band. Um, <clears throat> my clarinet teachers had served in the military. They were, I had amazing clarinet teachers. That was like clarinet central in that area because of the Cleveland Orchestra nearby. <clears throat> from there to college, my college band director was um, uh, Army Warrant Officer, you know, so I got all the repertoire. They did the repertoire. And then I really uh, just was laser focused to get into one of the bands in Washington. I didn't care. I just wanted to be in one of the bands in Washington, top of the top, premier bands, like my college band director, that's all they always talked about. And uh, <clears throat> eventually, uh, I, there were no openings like that when I got out of college. So I ended up joining the Army anyway. And very luckily, there was an opening and I made it into the Army Field Band, you know, and um, toured the world with them. And then when I retired, um, I was really, really lucky that Hargrave Military Academy in Virginia offered me, well, and asked me to interview for a band director position, almost like a warrant officer position. It was funny because when you're in the band, you don't really do the same thing, especially like in street parades or on the field. It's kind of follow the leader. So I had to learn the officer's position a bit. And um, so it was a big learning curve. I was lucky the Danville Symphony picked me up immediately. And when I was doing that, so I did that for the five years, first five years after I got out. And two years into it, uh, the Armed Forces School of Music here in town <clears throat> asked me to start coming and teaching for the summer. And that's how I started coming to Norfolk. And then I played some recording session and I met Frank, um, flute player Frank. Um, Jones. Jones and Eddie and Ralph Copley on that recording gig. And they were down a clarinetist. And then they asked me, do you want to play? So I would work for the School of Music and play with the Tidewater Winds. And that started around 2008 or 9. <clears throat> and then I moved here to get my master's degree and uh, continue to teach at the School of Music, whose contract was eventually canceled. But um, I just kept playing with the winds all that time, and that's how I wound up here. Totally comfortable. I know the repertoire. I grew up on the repertoire. I, I just I just know that kind of a, a job inside out. I was, like, raised for it, born and bred to do it. Well, and that's a good point because the consistent thing that I'm hearing from all of you is there's this, the regiment of the military, the protocols, the, the practicing, ooh, um, but the passion for the music and for the performance. Um, let's talk about March 16th, when the world said we're in a pandemic and we're gonna have to shut down. Um, what happened to that passion in music? Did you guys just kind of pack it away and say, okay, I guess we'll come back? Ken, what? How's it been when life, how's your life changed since COVID came in, into the world? Yeah, actually, um, it's changed quite a bit. Uh, I had I had gigs booked all throughout the summer uh, with the different uh, bands that I play with locally. Um, pretty much one by one, I kept getting phone calls that those gigs were canceling. Um, I remember specifically, I was playing with a ska band uh, with on uh, on St. Patrick's Day, and that was the last indoor gig that I did. Uh, over the summer, I had three or four outside gigs, a brass quintet gig, a rock band gig, and a Dixieland gig. Uh, those were outdoors, um, but pretty much uh, I, I haven't had any work um, all since then. Um, so it's been a tremendous change. Like Tom was saying, uh, and I'm sure Kathy agrees, I mean, we keep practicing because we love to play. Uh, and we know that if you if you don't let if you don't keep practicing, you're going to lose your physical ability to actually play at a professional level. Uh, I, I for one have always loved practicing over the years, so it hasn't been a it's not a job for me, and I'm sure it isn't for them because you, it's something you do you're passionate about. It's just been like Tom was saying agree, again, agree with what he said. You vary your practice routine. I'll play with some play alongs for some jazz stuff. Um, I'll play along with uh, a classical trombone 
solo recording for that kind of playing. Um, you know, play some etudes, a lot of scales, a lot of uh, you know technical type practicing. So yeah, it's it's been it's been hard. And the other part of that is it's in your heart to perform for people, and so you miss that that emotional part of it, being on stage, uh, making art, uh, and then the people who are there, they're, they're the second part of the equation because they're enjoying what you're doing for them. Mm -hmm. And so it's, uh, it's been, it's been a big adjustment, you know, cause you don't have that. Yeah, Tom, you were talking about with the passion and, and by performing, making that connection with an audience. Does Becky listen to your music? Uh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's something, too, because we live in the same house. We don't do things necessarily physically the same. The music is, goes across the board. Um, but we're, we're different musicians. Um, we talk very little about music. Um, she has the things she's done her whole life that I've had success with. I have things I've done in my whole life. And uh, we, we kind of, uh, we don't share that practice in a way. The things we know our weightlifting, you know, the things that we push ourselves on. So, uh, um, Becky, tell them about your practice. Um, I do routines. It takes about an hour and a half to, to two hours, depending on how much I feel at the end. And I just go over exercises just to keep playing. Yeah, it's and very. Keep it, because it's so physical. Yeah, that's so the key is. It's so physical. if there was no one around to listen to you guys, you would still play. Yes, absolutely. But, but what does it mean to have somebody listening to you then? I, I don't play much piano in front of him because I don't want him listening. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there are barriers. And, and it's the same, you know, I, I shared in the earlier part that my daughter is a performer. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the one, t she's a singer. And she hates it when she walks into a room and someone says, perform, you know, sing us a song, <laughs> you know, because being a professional, there's the warming up, there's the, you know, it's not a matter of coming in and singing happy birthday, right? So Kathy, yeah, play your clarinet for us. Oh, I would hate that. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, but for someone who wants to hear you and like in the Tidewater Winds, you know, how does it feel to have that standing ovation at the end of the, at the end of the performance. That's oh, amazing. It's always amazing. So there is that connection. Definitely. So without that, over the last six months, how, you know, you hear a lot of performers are doing the virtual thing, you know, like the, uh, the, 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 the billboard awards were on the other night and they these huge productions and no audience. Um, Judy Collins came to the Chrysler Museum or Chrysler Hall. And, and did an entire concert with no audience and it's being virtually played now. What, it, how does that make you feel as a performer? I'll, I'll Boy, address any... that one if you want. Okay. Well, once the pandemic hit, yeah, it was like everybody, <clears throat> a little bit of shell shock, like what are we gonna do? What are we gonna play? Trying to stay in shape. And I don't know about you guys, but until the gyms and stuff were open, I felt like my fitness level was declining a little bit. And so much of playing wins is like really takes a lot of um, <clears throat> endurance and stamina. But um, I was just really lucky that some people, there's a, an app called Acapella and it's designed to do coll remote collaborations. Mm -hmm. So I was really lucky to have a friend of mine that was uh, just started doing those, ask me to do some. And we began doing the virtual thing, and um, geez, we really had a, a pretty good following. I mean, we've gotten three, 4,000 viewers sometimes, and a lot of connection. I've met a lot of people doing those. And so it enabled me to stay in shape, and it enabled me to play with somebody else and be able to put it out there and have people enjoy it. I mean, I, we, we got a fan following from that. And then from there, I've been now trying to learn to do um, my own editing. I've taken an editing class and stuff like that and <clears throat> shoot myself playing or shoot the video, shoot the audio and put it together and do some cool things. So I've had a pretty good connection with my audience. 
but I mean, it's not like playing live and uh, necessarily like playing with the people next to you and responding back to what you hear. But now doing it on the acapella app, there is some, some degree of that. So that's how I've managed this. I think I've done since Mar since that happened, maybe 10 videos since then. And I just uh, got in the planning stage of the next two to do some holiday music. And um, so that's how I'm managing to stay motivated because yeah, it, it, gets to, it gets hard to practice after a while. I'm the same as these guys, a lot of scales, articulation, studies, you know, um, I've continued teaching during that time. So my, I have to stay in shape somewhat for my students too because some of them are really good and I can't have my butt kicked by a 16 year old or a <laughs> So like, it's a lot of, it's a lot of work being a musician. About. And woodwind players, I mean, we have the constant uh, repair and key work situation going on too. Woodwinds go out of adjustment just constantly. So it's expensive to keep your horns perfect too. Brass, you guys have that, but I think a little bit less maybe than we do. But uh, oh, somewhat. Yeah. But they I do have... go out. They they can't lick their stuff. But you still spit in your you still spit in your instrument though. He does. I don't. <laughs> I'm not too spitty either. <laughs> Well, there's, is he, the, I always mention this, the oboe player, it seems like he's constantly wiping his instrument down. Yes. Yeah. They've done studies and the trumpet, the oboe, and the bass trombone are the biggest violators of spray. So uh, um, uh, the French horn, the clarinet, although I have seen clarinet players playing in the Orient that have a black almost like a towel over the top six or eight inches of their clarinet and plastic sheets between each player uh, and are still performing but at great cost, government so, cost. Right. Kathy mentioned the cost of, of playing. So let's, let's talk about those musicians. And I know we hear a lot about them from like the New York, the you know, with Broadway being shut down now till May. The, the cost to the performers of not performing. Um, and a lot of, as we've talked in the earlier part with the military, with a lot of people who are going gig to gig, you know, you, you're, you're putting your passion and your love of music ahead of your economic uh, advancement. Um, what has been the impact on the industry when it comes to income and, I mean, what you know, are you hearing I mentioned from your earlier friends? that I was, on a cruise ship and I said goodbye to the musicians when we finally got off um, because of being trapped from COVID. Um, oh, no. Every one of those musicians was going to go from making a living to zero. Mm -hmm. And they were from all over the world and they were going to go home with no job. And when they get home, there would be no job. Any musician who was, was making a living in music has zero. Now we were fortunate. Um, all of us playing in the Tidewater Winds, we all had nice government pensions mm -hmm. after working for 20 or 30 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, besides Social Security and everything else that comes along. So uh, we're not in that same category, but a lot of people are. And yep. it is heartbreaking. Well, well and Becky and I are on the board of, tide, of Tidewater Winds. And, yes. you know, of course, as we talked earlier, you know, um, in the early days, it was a union, and and you all get you you are professional musicians and deserve to be paid, and then giving a free concert. So it has put some real challenges on the Tidewater Winds, and and I think people say, well, there's no concerts. I guess we'll go find something else to do. But there are demands in order to keep the organization alive that need to be met. Um, yes. You know, financially. One of the things I've said about the arts, they have survived through anything that mankind can go through for thousands of years, actually. You know, music has continued to, to, um, to be made, uh, to be written, to be created uh, during the Black Plague or anything. So how do you see your industry kind of making it through this shutdown mentality? Um, well, if I could... Yeah, I'd like to I'd like to say what what Kathy was bringing up earlier 
musicians have always been adaptable um, because of, like you said, the circumstances that musicians find themselves in trying to make a living. Um, what Kathy said she's been doing is with the uh, online performing. I have many friends in the industry locally that have been doing these kind of one-off performances. Um, someone who's played with the Tidewater Winds has been doing these concerts every week um, online. So I think a lot of musicians have, have tried to shift, you know, their focus a little bit during this time because they don't actually have a way to make a living at it performing in, in person live. And so they've tried to uh, utilize the current technology out there to try and make a little bit of money online. Um, and so I think the future, I think there's always going to be a future for live music. I think once we get through the other side of this pandemic, people are going to, they're going to want to be out with other people experiencing live music in person again. And I think there's going to be a big hunger for it um, because we've had to go so long without it. And, uh, you know, a lot of the musicians right now, they're doing other things to pay the bills. Uh, because there just aren't enough live performance jobs and online performance opportunities for them to actually make a living to doing this. And so, you know, some of them may not come back. Uh, you know, I don't know. I, I think it's going to come back, but it's just a real question of when uh, and how many of the people that were doing it before the pandemic are still going to be able to do it after mm -hmm. the pandemic. Well, just, you know, looking at the subtleties, I would have loved to have done this conversation um, over at uh, Tom and Becky's house on the, on the sofa and, uh, <laughs> and, and have you guys pick up some tunes, but we can't do that now. And so we have to, we have to adapt. Um, so I, I see a, I think it, it is part of our culture to have music and the arts. Yeah, yeah and no matter Tidewater how we're gonna... winds are, the Tidewater winds are really special. Oh, I mean, yeah. there aren't that many concert bands, much less of professional quality in the country. And uh, what John has done to keep it relevant has kept it alive. And I think he needs to be the, he is the soul of the band. And uh, it's, it's a treasure um, to see something this rare. People, uh, may not realize sometimes that this is something you will not see in very many cities around. It's a good, entertaining, powerful concert band. Yeah, and they're using this time to really evaluate kind of what we've been talking about. What's tomorrow gonna bring? How do you, mm -hmm. how do you become, stay relevant and, and respond to what tomorrow is? And I think the opportunity for education is, is huge. Um, and, you know, this is also a good time kind of in life to do all those things that you say, if I only had time, I would practice more, you know, and, uh, or re-gear, you know, there's the infamous Peter, Peter, uh, what's the, um, this, the concert, uh, Peter Rabbit, uh, where you have the different instruments, you know, getting into the education piece uh, and, and introducing the Tywater Winds to a whole new audience. Or also, what does the Tywater Winds look like? You know, it was an exciting concert series in July to kind of stay relevant. Uh, you know, now that you mentioned spray rather than spit, you know, keeping it a safe concert and keeping it in safe distance um, and being resilient. I want to thank you guys for, uh, for being a vital, vital part of, uh, of what Hampton Roads is all about with the Tyler Winds. I've had the pleasure and the privilege to, uh, to announce in your concerts quite often. So you, you know how I feel about that cacophony of, warming up and and the kind of music that you even make when it's out of control and out of the box and then those arms go up with john and the concert begins um and we're going to be back in that someday but in the meanwhile your love and passion for what you do and as we've been talking about throughout this whole series also your commitment to honor and country in your service to to our nation through the military through marching bands with the kids it's been uh, it's been awesome so thank you can i say something though bob i will always say yes to you okay um now that i'm on the board i am finding out how hard that board works and i just i can't make it plain enough to everybody 
just how hard we actually are working. I am doing more than I ever thought I would do. Yeah. And for so many, they walk into the auditorium, they sit down, they chit chat with their friends, the music begins, they start quieting down, John's arms go up and they're entertained for two hours and they have no idea how it worked. Mm -hmm. And the idea, the idea that you guys are actually talking about practicing and exercising and, and perseverance, and, and that's what makes your life. Nobody who comes to enjoy the music, I think really appreciates that. And it's the same thing with the board in becoming, yeah. keeping, keeping the organization so it can be resilient and, um, and flexible and yeah. responsive. Bravo. Yeah. yeah. I, I would sing, but I can't sing. I have no rhythm. I can't. That's why I announce. It's I fine. Can talk. <laughs> Keep it that way, right? Yes. <laughs> Thank you for everything. We are looking forward to seeing you on stage with those spit rags and shields yep. or whatever it takes to put together some good music, right? We're ready. Thanks. Yes. Soon. Hope it's safe. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Bob. Appreciate Thanks, it. Bob.